Welcome to the next video lecture in Introduction to Machine Learning. Now we're going to be talking about um, K nearest neighbors regression. So we'll um, take a first peek at a very simple and very popular machine learning method for supervised learning and specifically um, talk about how it this works for regression tasks. Okay, so um, let's get started. Okay. Um, What's the intuition behind the nearest neighbors method? Well, it's almost uh, included in its name. Yeah, so the idea is that, um, all right, let's, let's motivate this with an example. So say we have locations of cities in two different countries and we know which city is in which country. But we don't know specifically because, I don't know, for some reason our map is weird. We don't know where exactly the border between these two countries is. Yeah. And now for any given location, we want to figure out whether it belongs to country A or country B. Yeah. Now, one rule that you could have, if the only thing you know is where the cities are and to which country they belong to, is to say, okay, well, every location belongs to the same country as the city that is closest to that location. And that's the nearest neighbor rule. Okay, um, and you can extend this, it makes it make it a little bit more complicated by saying, okay, well, I'm not just looking at that one city that is closest to the location that I want to classify as country A or country B. I'm not just looking at the closest neighbor, I'm looking also at the second and the third and the fourth closest neighbor. So I'm looking at K of them, the K closest neighbors, yeah? And I'm basically taking a vote and saying, okay, well, if three of the five closest neighbors are country A, then I assume that this location is country A. Yeah? Okay. So that's the idea of K nearest neighbor. Now, let's uh, make this a little bit uh, more precise. So first of all, for first important thing here is that K nearest neighbor methods can be used for both regression and classification. We're not talking about classification yet, so here we'll talk about k-nearest neighbor regression. The idea is that we generate predictions for our target variable for a given combination of features x by looking at which other observations are closest to the x that we currently have. So we're looking at distances in the feature space. Yeah? We're looking at the closest ones that are most similar in terms of their features um, than the one for which we want to generate predictions. Yeah? Um, and then, well, we're using those to generate predictions. So what we need, first of all, is a way to quantify distance or similarity, which are opposite terms for the same concept basically yeah we require some kind of distance or similarity metric in the covariate space in the simplest case we'll just use the euclidean distance yeah but we'll talk about that um and then the second thing is we have to decide how big we want the neighborhood to be yeah are we just looking at the one nearest neighbor are we looking at three nearest neighbor seven nearest neighbor 15 nearest neighbors and that's precisely what we have here. Yeah. Um, so we need um, slightly more terminology for any um, point X. Now this is not an observation. This is just any combination of feature values X. Yeah. We, we need to figure out what the k closest actually observed feature vectors x i r and we call that set of the k closest points to any coordinate x we call that the k neighborhood of x yeah so if we visualize that um so this light green dot that's our x and if we set k to three then the k three nearest neighbors are those three um, dark green dots. Yeah, so the K neighborhood, that will be those three dots. Okay, don't worry about the circle. Yeah, the circle, we'll get back to that. 
Okay, but the, the K neighborhood is not the circle, it's specifically the set of these three points. If we extend that to seven, well then the, the K equals seven neighborhood, well that would include these seven points. Yeah, and if we go up to 15, then that would include all these points. Um, now, let's go back to that graph. Let's talk about that circle. Because how large or small K is, basically defines at defines how large the neighborhood will be that you look at but not in the sense that it's always like a given distance yeah uh, but just in a sense that well if k is small then you're really only looking at a small tend, tend to look at smaller more local neighborhoods and as k increases you're looking at much larger neighborhood. So you, you're basically extending the scope of things that you consider to be so similar to this point that you want to use them to predict what happens at this point in your feature space. Yeah. So here we have a two dimensional feature space x1 and x2. All right. Um, how to calculate distances? Well, the most popular way to do it is the one that we already know. It's just a simple Euclidean distance. The Euclidean distance is just uh, the square root of the sum of the quadratic distances in each coordinate. Yeah, so we have a uh, data point x and a data point x tilde, both in a p-dimensional feature space where all the features are real numbers. Then the Euclidean distance between these two vectors is just, uh, well, the square difference in each coordinate summed up and then taking the square root of that. Yeah, that's the Euclidean distance. Um, <clears throat> so if we have these three data points, 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, then we look at what the, and we compute the Euclidean distance um, in this, between B and A and B and C, we can see that A has a smaller distance to B then C to B, so A is the nearest neighbor for B. That's not the only distance measure we could use. Um, there's another one that's popular. Um, it's called the Manhattan distance. That just takes the sum of the absolute deviations. And it's called the Manhattan distance because if you think about, um, basically, it just sums up how far along each axis you go. So you can, you're not looking at diagonals like the Euclidean distance does. You're only looking at uh, basically going parallel to one of the axes. And it's called Manhattan distance because obviously in Manhattan, because all the streets are like perpendicular, you can only go like that. Okay, that's why it's called the Manhattan distance. Okay, another very popular choice is the Mahalanobis distance, which also basically takes into account how the features are correlated um, with each other. Um, but okay, that's uh, maybe for a later lecture. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the Manhattan distance as I just said, it's basically just the sum of the distances along each axis. Yeah. And the Euclidean distance, that's the length of uh, this uh, line from X to X tilde directly. That's the geometric interpretation of these two distance measures. All right. Um, there's also um, the problem here of um, maybe sometimes not having all features that are like all um, numerical features. And then you need something called the Gower distance. Yeah, because if we have also categorical data or maybe some missing data, then we still want to be able to compute a distance. So um, the Gower distance for a feature vector is um, composed of a weighted sum of Gower distances of the components of the feature, the feature vector, okay? So, um, and these weights here, these depend on whether one of the variables feature values is missing or not for one of the vectors, yeah? So, um, or, <clears throat> well, also, yeah, there, there are different things here. Also, um, you can basically fine tune it to mean that maybe for a binary feature vector, some categories are not as informative as the other. So, you know, it doesn't really matter whether both people are not colorblind, 
But if one of them is colorblind and the other is not, well, that's an important distinction. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that's these deltas. Not too important for us. More important to look at these Gower distances for the specific features or variables. Um, so for variables that really where we can only say, well, are they the same or are they distinct? This distance is zero if they're the same and it's one if they're not. Yeah. So if you think about things like maybe, I don't know, hair color or so. Yeah. So we can do a distance between hair colors that basically says, well, the distance is zero if they both have the same hair color and the distance of one if the hair color is different. Okay. Um, and for other variables, this uses just the absolute difference of both of the values yeah, divided by the maximal possible distance in the data set. So divided by the total range of that variable. Yeah. Um, so um, this example here, not going to go through it in detail because that takes a little bit too long, but you can uh, take a moment to, to get acquainted with it. Um, shows you an example of computing the Gower distance um, with data on sex and income. And I just want to um, show you briefly here what is meant by the distance in terms of salary. So here we have a distance between object one and two in terms of the salary. Yeah, that's this component here. So it's the difference between these two, 2340 minus 2100 divided by the maximal possible difference. So the minimum, uh, so the maximum minus the minimum. Yeah. Um, all right. And um, okay, for the sex, well, you know, it's different here. So the distance here is one. For the distance between one and three in terms of the sex, well here, the information about sex is missing. So that doesn't basically come into that uh, into that sum here. And then also, obviously, the only thing that really matters is this. So we don't divide by two, we only divide by one. Yeah, so that's this delta here. Um, and similar for that. Okay, so that's uh, Gower distance. That's nice, because that gives us a way to compute distances, even for features that aren't really numeric and even in the cases where some of these values um, are missing are not available. Yeah, so that's a very important consideration for applied problems that this also works for um, that kind of data. Okay, um, additionally, we can use uh, weights. Um, so we can use weighted distances. Um, first of all, um, it's important maybe specifically if we're using not the Gower distance, there it doesn't matter, but if we're using the Euclidean distance, um, features can be measured on very, very different scales. Now, if you leave them on the original scales, that just means that if one feature goes from 1,000 to 10,000 and the other feature goes from zero to one, well, the only thing that matters for, for the naive distance is the first one. Yeah, because it, it varies over thousands. The other one is always between zero and one. So it won't really matter for the, the distance. Yeah, so standardization. Um, so um, we can assign a higher weight to values that basically vary over smaller scales, or we can standardize the features themselves. Um, that's one reason why we would maybe want to use weights. Um, another reason is that we can use weights if we have prior knowledge um, about which features are more important or maybe, yeah, something like maybe newer data should be more important than older data or stuff like that. Then we can assign weights uh, based on those considerations. Yeah, and then that still will give us a valid, um, <clears throat> a valid distance measure. Okay. Um, now, how does k nearest neighbors work? Well, um, typically, or in the simplest case, we'll just figure out what um, the relevant neighborhood is. Yeah, so we look at the feature vector x for which we want to generate predictions, and we'll determine which 
observations in our training data set are close enough to x so that they are among the k closest neighbors and then yeah and then we'll record okay well which observations are those and we'll look up the values of their target variables and we'll just take the mean over this k neighborhood of the observed target variable and that will be our prediction for this feature vector x yeah that's a simple case um another possibility here is to use weights and say okay well i'll actually i have already all these distances between x and um, my observations so why not put more weight in this in this average on observations that are actually closer to x yeah so here i'm basically doing a weighted mean over the elements of the k neighborhood all right um, so to summarize how does k and work well it has no optimization step and is a very local model yeah so there's uh, basically really not much to compute here um, it's a very assumption free method we are making no structural assumptions at all and we just basically saying our heuristic is things that are similar in the feature space are very likely to be similar in terms of their target variable so let's just use the things that are similar in the feature space to generate a prediction um as we make k smaller the method becomes less stable in the sense that small changes in x will change which neighborhood is relevant for that x so will affect the prediction if we make the neighborhood larger then we have to move much farther in the feature space in order to really change the prediction yeah because the the, the larger set of neighbors is more stable it doesn't change as fast as we move over the feature space yeah so um what KNN doesn't deal with so well is the presence of a lot of features that actually do not matter for the predictions yeah because they will still play a role in the distance calculation which controls the neighborhood so that will tend to mess things up and also what's very important is um, that KNN obviously is very sensitive to different uh, scales of the features in terms of distance calculation unless you're using the hour distance yeah so um, if the feature of the scales is not consistent with how important they are in the sense that features with larger values must be more important um, then this will break down okay um, all right and that's it for KNN let's uh, try to put KNN um, into our um, overarching broader framework um, so the hypothesis space of uh, KNN that's actually a pretty complicated thing it's step functions over tessellations of the covariate space where the pre precise tessellation depends on the observed configuration of feature vectors yeah um, it has hyperparameters that we have to basically use as inputs to our learner so we have to figure out what an appropriate distance measure is um, and we have to set the size of the neighborhood k yeah and as i said specifically the size of the neighborhood is also very important in terms of the risk for uh, KNN and learners well we can use any loss function for regression or classification yeah this is uh, possible for both okay and in terms of optimization well really that doesn't apply here it's not really necessary there's nothing to optimize here um, based on the risk function um, we will know basically analytically what the prediction that what algorithm to use for computing the prediction there's nothing to optimize here and um, what what in practice what we can optimize is the way that we look up the neighborhoods for a new point for which we want to generate the prediction so that could be sped up yeah we think about clever data structure to do that and also um 
avoiding the computation of all distances for a point for which we want to generate predictions. Yeah, if you think about your training data, maybe has 10 million points. If you need to compute 10 million distances, um, every time you want to predict for a new point in order to figure out which of these 10 million points is part of the K nearest neighbors, you're not gonna have a good time. Yeah, but uh, by doing clever things, this can be avoided. So this isn't really part of the optimization in the framework that we've defined it, but well, it's an important uh, consideration in terms of implementation. Okay, that's it about KNN. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching.